Well, welcome back again. Let's talk about the deliverable from the business system analysis, the result of analysis. You know, we have to go through the analysis. We're going to, I'm going to show you part of that in a few minutes. But we have to produce something, something that can be used by everyone. So what we're going to produce is a document, of course, that can be a hopefully an e-document, e but a document nonetheless. And that document will consist of some key components. First of all, you're going to have a project event list. I'm going to explain to you a little bit later on what an event is. Suffice it to say for now, an event is a condition or circumstance that your system has to be able to deal with and respond to. You're going to make a list of these. And when you're done, you're going to have that list in your document. And for each of the events, and there will be several, you're going to have some other information. You're going to have a business process diagram, a picture. There's going to be a narrative. There's going to be references to objects and data. You're going to have the business areas, the organizational units that are affected by that business process. You're also going to have a table that supports the data from which we're going to draw the business rules in this document as well. And for each of these objects, now an object is a collection of data. It's a thing that defines something else. For example, an object would be customer. And that object called customer would have information about the customer, such as the customer's name, their address, their email address, name of their firstborn, things like that. Okay, Anything that we need about the customer. Okay? <laughs> that object will have a definition as to what it is. For example, when we say customer, what do we mean by that? Is it somebody who buys something from us? Or is it somebody who wants to buy something from us and we know who they are? Some people might call that prospect. We'll have some business rules that say these are the rules that apply in our system, in our business, these are the rules that apply to this thing called customer. For example, we'll have some data attributes. Data attributes are data items such as customer name. That's a data item, Cust a customer address, customer email, and so forth. And once we encounter this data, we attribute it to the appropriate object. For example, that would belong to customer. So we'll have data attributes, we'll have unique identifiers. We'll have a way of identifying each individual customer, for example. And we'll have pointers associated with these objects. For example, we could have an object called customer, but we need to have pointers in this object called customer that point to an object that is about the payments we receive from the customer. So the payments we receive from the customer is something separate than the customer. But clearly, you want to be able to join them from time to time. In other words, if I know the customer, would I like to find the payments that they've made? Or if I know the payment, would I like to be able to find the customer who made that payment? And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later on. All of that stuff is going to be part of this document. So in front of you, I'd like you to look at this sample deliverable. This book is it's called a vendor registry. This was a, this is from a real project. Um, <coughs> it's done by a government services organization, so you can imagine that they've spent some time on it. Um, and this is their version of going through the project. Now it's very interesting because when I first encountered this project, I thought vendor registry. I mean, my goodness, they just want to keep track of those vendors who want to be able to sell things into their jurisdiction. In other words, they want to be able to have licenses for their jurisdiction, for their state or for their province. And I thought, well, how difficult could that be? It sounds pretty easy, keeping track of these vendors. Well, needless to say, 
they made it into something other than easy. They made it quite complex. So this document is the entire business requirements document. Everything you want to know about it is in there. So let's first of all, and you can look at this anytime you want, but not right now. <laughs> let's, let's turn to page eight um, in the document. Let's turn to page eight. Now, page eight, we have a project event list that's on the screen here. And you'll see that there's a whole list of these things we call events, these situations or circumstances or conditions that the system encounters or the business organization encounters, such as a vendor registers or renews their registration. So there's a whole list there of 39 of them that the analysis team came up with when they did this project. <clears throat> and we work on each one of them one at a time. We don't try to do everything all at once. We don't try to connect all the dots. We partition the effort to minimize complexity. We break it down to small pieces. This is our first effort of breaking it down. For that project, the vendor registry project, we've created a list of these events or circumstances that have to be covered off in the project. Now, we do this on the first day. It's not true that we'll find all the events right away. That's practically impossible. That's like foretelling the future. And I promised myself that the minute I can figure out reading the future, I'm going to quit what I'm doing, and I'm going to start focusing on tomorrow's closing stocks. You know, right? So we can't do that. Nobody can do that in this way. So we find a few of them, and then as we go through the process of analysis, we're going to find the events we haven't yet found. And I'm going to show you how that happens in a little while. So let's look at this one here, vendor registers or in renews registration. It says here that we have to have a business process diagram, we have to have a narrative, we have to have a bunch of other stuff for that. So if we turn to page uh, 22 in that sample, And on top of the page, it says a vendor registers. That's the event. So that's a situation we have to deal with. The vendor wants to register. Underneath that, there's a diagram. Never mind how the diagram works right now. We're going to talk about that in a little while. Okay? But there's a picture that tells the story, and you'll know how to make that picture in a little while. Okay? Underneath the picture, there are some references and pointers to some of the pages. For example, in the picture, if you look at about 10 o'clock on the picture, you will see that there's, between parallel lines, there's something called vendor. Well, that's what we call an object. So when we have an object called vendor, we need to know what is that. We have to know what information do we need, or what data do we need about vendor, what are the business rules about vendor, and so forth. And through the process of analysis, we uncover all of that, and it says, Underneath the picture it says vendor can be found on page 69. That's where we find the description of vendor. So go to page 69 for a moment. And on page 69, we find at the very top, we find vendor. And it says a vendor is a company or an individual that wishes to provide goods or services to the Air One government. And a vendor can be located anywhere inside or outside the country. So there we have our definition. Now we know what it is. Underneath it, we have some business rules. Now you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of business rules. There's almost a full page of these business rules. And the question is, where did they come from? How did we find those? And I'm going to show you how we find those in a little while. We're going to find those business rules through a table called the business rules table. I'm going to show you how this works a little bit later on. Okay? So there are these business rules. Below that, you'll see that there's a header called data attributes, or data items that have been attributed to vendor, in other words. And we have a vendor rating, their legal name, their operating name. Turn the page, and you'll see there's an address and a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, how did we find that stuff? 
Again, it's part of the analysis process. These are the important things once we find out what they need. And there's a whole page of that. And if you go to page 71, there's even more yet. We also have to have what we call a primary identifier or a unique identifier, or what some people call a key. And that's just a way of identifying a specific object. For example, this is a vendor, and as an analyst, we just put in vendor ID. We don't care about the composition of the key. We don't care about how, what it's composed of. We don't care how many characters it is. We don't care about anything about it because that's not business analysis. That has to do with data modeling and database design. So we're just saying, look, there has to be a key. So we'll give the name of the object, we'll add ID, and then we'll let the good database folks figure out all the technical details on that. We don't need to do that. It can't move us ahead. But we do need to do it, and you're going to see why a little bit later on. Underneath that, you'll see that there are pointers to related data objects. Remember I mentioned that over here when we looked at the screen? And I said, <coughs> we might have an object called customer. We might have another object, and a whole bunch of information about a customer. We might have another object called payment. And we have all kinds of information about the payments that, that the customer makes, such as the date of the payment, such as the amount of the payment, such as the tax amount, and so forth. And we need to be able to join these things together. For example, if I know the customer, the customer is John Smith. The question might come up, can we find the payment records for John Smith? And the answer is, well, we better be able to find those payment records. So we have to join them. So what we do is we artificially build in a pointer that points to the payment record, or which could be several. It could be lots of payment records from John Smith. Might only be one, but could be several. The other question is, well, what if I don't know who the customer is, but I know the payment record? I have a payment, I can identify it. Can I find the customer who made the payment? Well, the rule says we better be able to. So what we do is we build in a pointer into payment that points to the customer that made the payment. So in other words, I can find the customer if I know the payment. Or I can find the payments, if there's more than one, if I know the customer. And these are just pointers to related objects. Now the software development team, or the software engineers, database designers, they'll call that the foreign key. Because we have keys, which we've called unique identifiers or primary identifiers, but they call them keys. We call pointers to related objects, they call them foreign keys. And so we need to have that. And you're going to see why we need to have it as an analyst a little bit later on. We need to connect certain information. We've got to connect the dots, right? Okay. Go back to page 22. On page 22, we have a number of these objects in the diagram between the parallel lines. Vendor. Certification, for example, is another one. And it says if we want to find out what certification means, we can, and underneath the picture, the fifth item down is certification, and it's on page 61. Well, don't go there right now. You know, trust me that there's some definition of certification there, okay? But <laughs> so, so there's that information. Below that, on page 22, there's a list of the business areas that this process, the picture, and the narrative on the opposite side apply to, applies to, for example, it applies to um, procurement services, or contracting, and, and transportation, and media buyers, and corporate systems, and transportation. Uh, to all of, those, all of those business areas use this process. That would suggest we have spoken to all those people, wouldn't it? Right? All right. Over on the right-hand side, on page 23, there's a narrative. Now don't worry about the details of the narrative. It's the first half, the top half of the page. That style that that narrative was written in was chosen by the client who did this work. The important thing here is that as an analyst, 
you can choose any style you like, but there are certain key ingredients, there are certain things you must have in that narrative. And I'm going to show you a couple of other ways than the one you see here that make life just a little bit easier in terms of writing that narrative. Because, you know, writing that narrative, you know, we've found that a lot of people have difficulty starting the narrative, writing it, and finishing it. Because, well, it sounds like a small novel, doesn't it? And many people talk about that. They say, oh, you know, narratives should only be small. Yes, they should. Narratives shouldn't be too complicated. That's true. Shouldn't cover everything because the programmers will have difficulty then with that. That's true. So we won't do any of those things. We'll make it clear, concise, unambiguous, and brief and in business terms. I'm going to show you how to do that because if we take a picture, you know, a picture is supposedly worth a thousand words. But if, if you know that telephone game that kids used to play a long time ago? Whereas, you know, if we had 20 people, and if I gave this, this same picture, the same diagram, to 20 different people, and we all understood what it meant, and I said, okay, write a narrative. We'd have, out of those 20 people, we'd have 23 different versions, without a doubt. And what we really want is to have one version that everybody can hit on. Everybody can hit that target. Regardless of their style of writing, regardless of their grammatical prowess, regardless of their understanding about the use of punctuation and capitals, we can all hit the same target, even though the styles, or if you like, the dialects, become a little bit different. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, too. And there's an example of one style there on page top of page 23. On the bottom half of page 23 is what we call the reality check. One of the things that we're going to do when we focus on business requirements is we're going to focus on what is required without addressing how it's done. We're not going to look at the technology. We're not going to look at the architecture. We're not going to look at the hardware. We're not going to look at the software. We're not going to look at the partitioning of peopleware and software and hardware. We're going to look at simply what has to be done and then someone else later on is going to look at the technology architecture or, if you like, the solution design. Because first, in good architecture, comes what is required, followed by how we might do it. And you know, there's probably 27 different ways of doing any one thing. Let's figure out that one thing. So as then the experts in the technology the software development team, the software engineers, they can find the best way out of those possible 27 choices, they can find the best way of doing that one thing. As analysts, we don't want to start thinking about the 27 different ways something can be done because I guarantee you that's a road you go down and you don't come back from. And I can tell that some people have been there. <laughs> you just don't want to go there. So we're going to, again, partition the effort to minimize complexity. We're going to break it down into small pieces. One of the smallest pieces is focusing on that one thing that needs to be done, rather than looking at all the different possible choices, that the right people figure out how to apply the technology to what needs to be done. We're going to focus on what, not how. Okay, but there is a reality check anyway. You know, there's a theory and analysis that says you should never, by some people at least, purists. The last purist I knew was uh, Joan of Arc. And you know what happened to her, right? So you got to be a bit careful with being a purist and applying theory. And that is saying such things as we don't consider at all the technology, even though I said don't do that. Well, the reality is we sometimes have to give it some thought. Not in terms of determining the requirement, the what, but in terms of what are the constraints or the objectives that have been set by our management team. And on the bottom half of page 23, you'll see that there's a header that says technology and design issues, requirements, or considerations. And we have four different areas that somebody might say, oh yeah, but we need to do this. Or yeah, but we need, we can't do something else. Or we must take this approach. That's real life. 
So we have design and solution considerations. We have performance criteria. We have screen dialogue design considerations. And we have audit, security, and controls. Checks and balances, in other words. Okay. Now, pretty well everything can fit into those four categories. But you know, you can make up any categories you like. The important thing, however, is don't get hung up on this stuff. When somebody says, well, we're going to run this on this platform, just say, I understand, and make a note, and move on to the analysis. Because it is not technology architecture. It's business systems analysis. They focused on what you're supposed to do. But make a note and say, I got it. I understand. All right. So once this document has been produced, now this project here had, what, 39 different events? Uh, that's fairly robust. And you'll see in this document, when you look at it, that out of the 39 or so events uh, or circumstances and conditions and situations that the system will encounter, that the business processes are not one-to-one -one necessarily. Every event does not have, every business process, I should say, does not just deal with one event. So you'll find that here there are about 30 business processes dealing with 39 or so business events. Because a single business process can sometimes deal with more than one event. And we'll see, we're going to see a little bit later on how that works. Because we discover these things as we go along. Nowhere in this analysis do you have to figure out the future. You can only figure out the present. And when you get there, you'll say, oh, okay, I see. And you'll ask some questions. You'll make some judgments. You'll make good judgments, I hope. You, you know how we make good judgments? Right? You know the magic formula for that? It's called bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> or, as it's so nicely put, it's called experience, right? That, that enables us to make good judgment calls. So this document, when it's done, and you can look at it closely a little bit later on, can then be delivered and produced. We're going to talk more about this a little bit later on. But it can then be delivered or produced to the business units, to your business partners, or to anybody who needs to look at it. You can also send it to the internal IT group if it's someone other than yourself. And they can use it to either require software to do what's required for the business, or they can build. They can design and build that software. Or you can turn it over to vendors. Vendors of commercial off-the-shelf software or of custom, I was about to say customizable <laughs> software. Not necessarily a good thing, but you can do that too. You can turn it over to consulting firms. You can sell it, send it over to programming houses. You can send it to a, an organization to do some design, unless you can do your own design internally. So your internal IT may do design, and you may then send it offshore because it's tight. It's not abstract. It's not, I wonder what this means. None of those things. So you can actually send it offshore in your organization, and they can work with it, and you're going to get back good results. The other side is, of course, to use programmers onshore, the good programmers who can do the job down the street. That too. So you can send it to any of these.